I have the distinct privilege of introducing our featured presenter, Dr. Tia Martinez. And I'm not going to read her bio. It's in your program. You can read it for yourself. But let's just suffice it to say that she's well qualified to be up here today. And we are so excited um, to have her. So uh, last year, a group of um, all-in community warriors is what we kind of like to call ourselves, attended the National Prison Summit on Mass Incarceration in Nashville. And Dr. Martinez was the plenary speaker, the opening speaker, and the topic, of course, was the school to prison pipeline. And my, my lane is, is prison side, so I thought, ah, you know, I'll get about half, right? I'll get, ah, you know, I'll just pay attention to half of it. Um, by the end of our session, all of our team of nine were just captivated. And we came out of that session and said, we need to bring her to Ohio because what she does makes sense. And it will help us as the church do what Bishop Palmer said, fulfill our call to visit those who were imprisoned, but not only imprisoned behind bars, locked down, but imprisoned in their own homes, in their own communities. So how do we move from the response of incarceration to the prevention of incarceration? And that's where we're going to be going today. So what we're going to do, what Dr. Martinez is going to do for us is, um, you know, in, a, in my faith tradition, we believe God is always at work. And he's always bending the arc of today towards justice and love and peace. And so what Dr. Martinez is going to do is she's going to help us face today the reality that too many of our children, despite the very best efforts that all of us are putting forward in this room, in our lives, that too many of our children are being born into families that are just struggling to survive, are being born into communities full of toxic stress, trauma, and disadvantage. Too many of a particular race and class of children are growing up with the understanding that it is almost guaranteed that they will be incarcerated at some point. Too many. And it's growing. And we are frantically trying to keep up. And after hearing Dr. Martinez, we came back convinced that if we understand the origins of what's happening in our communities, we can change those outcomes. And that's what we're going to do today. She is going to make for us this school, to, this community to prison pipeline explicit. We're going to look at it in its entirety. We're going to put language around it, develop narratives around it, examine it with new images, bring that implicit community systems of disadvantage out of the darkness and into the light. And that's just this morning. <laughs> I ordered the comfortable chairs, let me just say. <laughs> um, this afternoon, Dr. Martinez will introduce us to solutions and strategies to dismantle this pipeline. Each one of us has a lane. Each one of us is touching it. How do we dismantle it together where we currently sit? The reality is the community to prison pipeline is a social epidemic that we must get our hands and our hearts around and strategically work together to change. And today is the day that we're going to start building those bridges of opportunity to do that. So we want this to be an engaging dialogue. There is a microphone over here. There's a microphone. This microphone is going to go over there. If you have questions, please get up. Go to the microphone and ask them so that we can also record that on the live stream and also on the, um, the video that's going to be available um, after this event. So without um, going on and on, I present to you Dr. Tia Martinez. When we talk about the school to prison pipeline, a lot of times what we do immediately is go to kids, right? Got kids being suspended, kids, that's what we jump to. It's my belief that in order to understand it, you need to talk about how the conditions of their parents and their grandparents' lives changed. That's really where the origin is, so that's what I'm gonna begin with. I'm gonna talk about this 50 years that basically spans my life. Basically from 1970 to now, a bunch of things that changed during that time. 
for families. The first one, right here, this says structural shifts in the economy, which is just an academic way of saying that good, well-paying jobs for people with a high school degree or less in this country disappeared. Okay, what do I mean by that? In 1970, guessing, who do you think was the biggest employer in the United States? Ford is very close. General Motors. General Motors. Okay, so everybody, what was a job? Think, close your eyes. Think about a job at General Motors. What's a job at General Motors like? Factory work, right? You're on, a, on the line, right? You know? Is it the kind of work where you really get to be all, you know, you get totally get to self realize yourself and there's like a meditation room and <laughs> it's hard work, right? It's hard, repetitive work. Does, uh, but does it pay well? It did at that time in 1970, right? Did you have health coverage? Did you have a retirement plan? Did you know more than 24 hours in advance your schedule? Could you take vacation? Did you get sick days? Okay. Did you have a union? Okay. Who's the biggest employer in the United States today? Walmart. The biggest employer now is Walmart. Now, what is a job like at Walmart? Oh, does it pay well? Mm -hmm. um, is working one job enough? You're gonna have to work. You're gonna have to apply for SNAP for food stamps, most likely, right? What about the conditions of work, right? You know, uh, what's that like? Is it easy work? Is it hard work? Is there someone monitoring what you're doing? Someone clocking everything you do, right? Making sure you're efficient, right? Is it the kind of job when the, 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 the principal calls you and says, you know, your kid's having a hard time, I need you to come down. Can you, can you take that time off? Can you do that and go, and go down and talk in the middle of the day? And if you do do that, what happens to you? You get fired, you lose your job. Do you have a union? Do you have retirement? Right? So, there it is. It's really important to understand. We talk a lot about everyone needs to go to college. And it's true that college is important because that's where the well-paying jobs are, right? But the thing is, we act like jobs that don't require a high school degree, a, a, a college degree, disappeared in this country. But they didn't. In fact, still, most of the jobs in this country require a high school degree or less. The only difference between now and 1970 is they pay terribly now, and conditions are terrible. So jobs change, and you just need to think about how does that affect parenting? How does that affect parenting? A study just came out looking at inconsistent scheduling, like Walmart does. So what they have is they have algorithms. They have computers that are figuring out the most efficient way to do it, and people are getting you know, maybe five, six hours notice on when they're gonna work, right? And they're doing everything they can to keep you under 40 hours so they're not to pay, right? So all of this is happening. In this study, they, they looked at uh, uh, folks who had, were working under those conditions versus people who knew their schedules at least a week in advance. And what they found is the folks with the uncertain schedules reported way more behavioral problems with their kids, right? And you know that, right? Kids need routine, right? So, Jobs changed at the very time that jobs were disappearing. And I might say, jobs that, most of those really good jobs were for men, right? They were dominated by men, right? Just as those jobs were going away, what was increasing, right? So between 70 and now, jobs go away, what goes up? What? Drug use. Drug use, anything else? Crime, anything else? Prisons. The number of people in prison between 1970 and now increased 430%, okay? So remember like 430%. Now that's just federal and state prison. If you include jail, the increase is 800%. So what happened, right? What happened? We heard drugs, we heard crime. So you gotta go back to 1970 again, late 60s, early 70s. Um, during this time, 
things were changing rapidly, right? Norms were changing incredibly rapidly. And we just seen major civil rights victories after decades and decades of organizing, right? Now, as African Americans and Chicanos and women, as all of these groups began to get more power, it made the old guard nervous. People got nervous, right? People were nervous, especially when it came to things like voting, right? When you had real power. It made a lot of white people nervous. And Nixon relied on this. He used this, okay? So imagine, in 1963, you could have a governor of Alabama say, you know, uh, uh, segregation yesterday, segregation today, segregation tomorrow. You could just, you could say, I'm a segregationist the way you say I'm a Methodist, right? It was just, well, this is my, my heritage, this is my belief system, right? That changes rapidly. Such, in five years, by 68, you can't do that anymore. You can't say that. It's not okay. The painful part to me, I've been giving this talk uh, for many years before Trump was elected. And I used to say, well, yeah, it's like it is now. You can't say that stuff. Unfortunately, it, the progress isn't linear, right? And now we actually hear a lot, of, a lot of that stuff from people in power. But at this particular point, you couldn't do that. The Republican Party saw a chance to break the New Deal coalition, right? The coalition that had brought us the New Deal, brought us Social Security, right? What they, needed, what they realized they needed to do is they needed to get these white people who were really nervous because black and brown people were gaining power. But they had to bring them away from the Democrats. They had to talk about race without using any word about race. Without, they had to say it was about race, but not say it was about race. So they need a code word, right? So they chose a code word. This is 1970. What was the code word? The code word was crime. Okay? And over the next 40 years, we saw it crack, urban, welfare. We saw a whole range of words that became proxies for talking about race and specifically for talking about black people without saying that. Now, this was also during a time when the baby boomers were coming into their, their, their prime uh, uh, crime committing years, right? The boomers were like 18 to 24. Right? So we were also experiencing a huge crime boom. They exploited these two things to create an amazing political strategy. Tough on crime, okay? So it worked beautifully. What they did is they got elected, they broke the, 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 a lot of white Southerners away from the Democratic Party, and they fulfilled those promises. They were so successful, this isn't just a Republican strategy. This is a Democrat, it became everybody's strategy. And what did it involve? It involved this idea is that we were too soft on criminals, right? So it did two things very concretely. The first thing is it changed what crimes were considered misdemeanors and what crimes were considered felonies. It expanded those that were felonies. Now, what's the difference between a misdemeanor and a felony? Yeah, prison. Prison versus jail, right? A felony, you can be punished a year or more, right? So uh, what's the difference uh, between having a misdemeanor on your record and a felony on your record when you go to get a job? Just about everything, right? So it makes a difference. The first thing they did is they said, they, you know, this was the beginning of the war on drugs, right? So the first thing they said is, we're going to take all of those nonviolent drug offenses, which were misdemeanors, and we're gonna make them felonies, right? So literally, if you had been carrying weed in your pocket one day, that would have been a misdemeanor. You could have got a notice to appear, right? You could have, you could have been cited out. The next day, you're gonna be locked up, and if, you're, if you take the plea, you're gonna to go to prison. So they changed what equaled a felony. The next thing they did is they changed the punishments attached to that. So, are people, yeah, I'm sure you all are familiar with the term mandatory minimums. I'm sure in your ministry you deal with folks who have faced these. The idea then was that judges were being too soft on crime. Okay? So it used to be that judges had a lot of autonomy. 
They had a lot of discretion in forming sentences. So there's a guilt phase of a trial, and usually that's plea bargained, right? You know, people take a plea. Then there's, you, then there's the, the, the sentencing part, the part where you decide what the punishment is going to be. They're separate parts. And in that sentencing, it used to be the judge would hear from everybody, right? Hear from the victim and the victim's family, hear from the social worker who did the write-up of the person, hear from their community, their, their family, hear about everyone, and then use all of that to kind of tailor a sentence that made sense, right, to this, with the idea being that you want to rehabilitate someone. Well, that was thrown out the window. They said, no more discretion for judges. No more rehabilitation as the point of this. It's pure incapacitation and punishment. So they created basically matrices, right? This is your second felony with a gun and a ga your name's on a gang list. That means you have to, regardless of the situation, you're going to get at least five to seven years. And the judge can't do anything about it. It's like a, a, a big shoplifting. If you shoplift over a certain amount, uh, uh, in terms of value, it's a grand theft, right? You know, suddenly you had people going away for a range of nonviolent stuff, much of it connected to behavioral health issues, in particular substance abuse, for a very, very, very long time. Okay? So now if more people are being charged with felonies and convicted, that means more people going to prison. And if they're staying there for a long time, Right? So now you go away for a very long time. What's happening to the prisons? It's what you all said about your, your jail, right? Was it something like, supposed to have 850, has 13, 14, right? That's what it looks like. You see this explosion in the number of folks in prisons, okay? A lot of these policies were created by California, okay? Um, California kind of, uh, was the innovator on this. In particular, three strikes, right? The rule that said, if you have three felonies, you go away forever, automatically, okay? Now, during this time, the Democrats fully embraced tough on crime. In fact, the Democrats and Republicans were trying to, like, in a competition to see who could be toughest, right? So there, this was not, you know, this was all of us. This is the Clinton administration. This is the 1994 crime bill. Okay, how many people are familiar with the 94 crime bill? Yeah, so the legislature and the president saw California and said, man, that is amazing what California is doing. This is great, that's what we need to do elsewhere. But remember, because of the federal, we're, we're a federalist uh, set up here in the United States, so the federal government can't, um, it has limited powers. It can't go in and infringe on something that is, is a power of the state. And almost all justice and education stuff, that's the states. That's the states. You can't do it. So they couldn't say, we're going to, they can change the federal law, but that's always just a slice of prisoners, right? They can't go change out everyone's state law, and they can't say, you can. now they can't make you do it, but they can provide incentives, little rewards, little bribes. So if you do it, you get this. That's the, yeah, people in education, that's Title I monies, right? So all of the federal money, you don't have to take that. If you do take it, though, you needed to, to be in line with whatever ESCA or NCLB testing requirements, right? That was the trade-off, OK? So what happened is after the 94 crime bill, these laws spread like wildfire. Essentially, they scaled mass incarceration, right? They said, listen, if you pass this law, you know what we'll give you? We'll give you money to build prisons. And it worked incredibly. But you know, the, the government being the government needs to have some indicators, needs to have an accountability system. You need to file your reports, right? So we just can't keep on giving you this money for prisons year and year and year. What did the, what did the states need to show? They needed to show that they could fill those prisons up. And hence, we got mass incarceration, okay? Now, mass incarceration and the war on drugs didn't just affect what was going on, right, in terms of prisons. It also changed policing, right? How did policing change, 
Okay? Policing became militarized. We began to fight things like the war on drugs, right? So you go from a beat cop model, right, to this, this you know, basically uh, uh, police officers on SWAT teams looking like soldiers. In communities where you're not like, you know, officer friendly or whatever, it looks like you're in an occupied territory, right? And as policing became more aggressive, it also became more targeted. How many folks here have heard about a, pol a theory of policing called broken windows? Okay, cool. What's broken windows? Broken windows is a theory of policing that says you gotta sweat the small stuff, okay? Like, you know, if, if you let people get away with little things, you're sending a message out saying, if you can get away with little things, you can get away with anything, right? You send a message out that disorder is okay. So you need to be really strict about the tiny things. Otherwise, they're gonna to come to big things, right? So the idea is that you need to strictly enforce minor misdemeanors. Riding your bike on the sidewalk, open containers, graffiti, jumping turnstiles. These are things that traditionally police deprioritized, right? People would come, you know, they, they wanna get the bad guy. They wanna get the serious stuff. This inverted that, okay? And it was targeted at certain neighborhoods, okay? So, <clears throat> and the police officers set, the, the chiefs set quotas. <laughs> Essentially, they had to do, they had to give certain number of citations, right? Okay. And the neighborhoods that they, they, they basically targeted whole zip codes. Now, if you know anything about violent crime, one thing we know absolutely is that it's highly localized. Okay, what do I mean by that? Violent crime doesn't happen across a whole zip code. It's not like that, right? It happens like at certain street corners, right? It happens at certain houses on a block face, right? It's very low. So, that, you know, now we have something called hot spots policing. Then it was a, a whole zip code. So what happens, the zip codes that were targeted we're all in seg racially segregated neighborhoods, right? So into these neighborhoods, you come with broken windows and you get stop and frisk, okay? What it's done is it's meant that the probability of someone being uh, arrested by the time they're in their mid-20s has something like quadrupled since 1970, okay? So all of this is happening, right? What then does suddenly the mass arrest and incarceration of folks in communities and the disappearance of good jobs, what do you think that has to do with this growth of disadvantaged families? And by disadvantaged families here, I'm talking about single parent families, families where you just got one, one, one adult trying to carry it all, right? So what, what do the green and blue have to do with the yellow? Say that again? Say it a little louder. You're removing fathers. You're removing fathers. Okay. So you're removing fathers. So the, the easiest one is this mass criminalization of the war on drugs, right? They're locked up. There's an article in the New York Times about two years ago. It was called 1.5 million missing black men. Okay. It looked at the census, in this case, the current population survey. It's the survey that we do every month to do the unemployment numbers, right? And they looked at it. And what you should see in any population cohort is a, the, at birth there are slightly more boys than girls, and then you're just you're pretty much the same number of men versus women all the way till you get to around the late 40s, 50s, and the men begin to die earlier, and you begin to see this. Right? Well, when they looked at it, they saw something really different in the black community. They saw same, 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 till you got to about 13 or 14, and then the men begin to disappear such that by the time you're in your late 20s or 30s, the gap in the ratio of men to women is huge, right? So they said, where were those men? So where were they? They were locked up. The thing is, that survey was a household survey, okay? It didn't count people in institutions. It didn't count people who were homeless. And that's where those black men were. So in a very concrete way, how do you form a family when that's happening? How do you form solid two-parent families 
when this is happening. And of course, people get out, but when you get out and you can't get back into the job market, it's even harder. But what about the blue? What about the blue? What does the blue have to do with single parent families? What's the big, okay, so they do all this research so they can confirm common sense, right? So what's the biggest reason that couples break up? Money. Money. <laughs> and indeed, that's what they find, right? So basically, there's this whole theory of like what a marriageable man is, right? He has to be employed, okay? If, if you have a couple and there's only one person who's making all the money, because that job of GM doesn't exist anymore, right? Okay, so do you need both parents to work? Absolutely, right? Okay, if one parent is unemployed and stays unemployed, that other parent becomes like another child, right? That you're taking care of. It creates enormous discord in relationships. It's just incredibly hard to keep them together. So we've seen an explosion in single parent families. And when we the issue with single parent families goes beyond just like, you need to be married, these are the rules, this is better. It's about resources, about resources for children. The quickest path to poverty is to be a single parent. The group with the highest rates of poverty, single parent families, okay, right? You lose that second income that now is absolutely necessary, okay? The other thing that's equally important, though, is you lose time. You need, like, what kids need is time. They need time, grown-up time, right? When you, when you took, when your children were, were very young and you brought them to try to find a preschool or a daycare center, you always wanted to know what was the teacher-student ratio, right? You want to know how much grown-up time for every little one, right? Well, it's the same in families, right? Now, single parents do this incredible, heroic thing. They stretch themselves in their time to try to meet all the needs of their kids. But they're only 24 hours in a day. And when you got one as opposed to two, you only got one set of 24 hours. And when kids have less grown up time, they suffer. So what we see absolutely consistently from 20 years of research is that children in single parent homes have lower graduation rates, have higher rates of behavioral problems, have higher incarceration rates. Over and over again, we see this. What do we know? And for some reason, that we don't completely understand, boys have a much harder time at it than girls. Boys in particular suffer. And certainly part of it is that most of the single parents are women, right? So you don't got the same gender thing going. But that's not all of it. It looks like, so at first they looked at, they said, wow, it, brothers and sisters in the same family, the boys were consistently doing worse, just on every indicator. And they said, what was going on? And at first they thought, I know what it is. The mom likes to do girl things with their girls, right? They're gonna get a mani-pedi, they're gonna do that stuff. So if we measure the time, we'll see that they're doing what's called differential investment in their daughters, right? So they do this crazy survey where they measure every minute of the parent's time. And what, did, what do you think they found? Are moms spending more time with their girls than their boys? Not all. What they concluded, there was absolutely no difference. What they concluded is that boys had a different production function, okay, for outcomes. What that means is for the same inputs, the same parental inputs, same educational inputs, the same neighborhood, all that you put in in a girl to get a certain outcomes, you have to put in way more of that for a boy. So you have to have greater inputs to get the same outcome, okay? And then there's the, the issue of how boys express their suffering. In, on average, what's the difference between how girls express suffering and boys express suffering? Externalizing versus internalizing. So the boys are gonna be acting out, right? In these neighborhoods, with all these police, right? Without dads. Let's talk about the fourth thing that changes, neighborhoods. Okay? Neighborhoods transformed over the last 50 years. How did they? Now in 1970, you didn't have whole neighborhoods that were all black or all brown and all really poor, okay? Now let me tell you, you sure had neighborhoods that were all black and all brown because before 1968, you had state-sponsored segregation, right? People could have, you know, you had a, a bunch of ways that literally 
black and brown folks had nowhere else to go but those neighborhoods, okay? What happened, though, is everyone had to be in those neighborhoods. So that meant that it was mixed social class, right? So everyone, so you had middle class people mixed in with poor folks. So on a block face, you had the family with the teacher. Perrin was a teacher next to the family unemployed, next to the construction worker, right? Next to the, the, the doctor. You had this mix of social class. And you had this mix of resources that people could, could draw on. What happened is after the Fair Housing Act passed, the Fair Housing Act was passed in the wake of, of, of uh, Reverend King's assassination. They had to do it. It's a very weak law. It is the first time that we outlawed racial discrimination in, in private real estate markets. It's huge, but it has almost no enforcement mechanisms. So is, it, is there racial discrimination in, in buying or renting a house? Massive. We do, we do these audit studies. We know there's a huge amount. But for the first time, for the first time, if you were a middle class, black or brown person, you can move out of the ghetto for the first time. And that's what folks did. Now, did you get to go live in the white suburb and it was all rosy? What happened when, when black and brown folks moved into those neighborhoods? White flight, they broke the blocks. White flight, no enforcement mechanisms. What did you get, black and brown suburbs? Usually adjacent to the barrio or the ghetto, right? But what happened to the folks left behind? What happened to everyone who couldn't move out? Because the Fair Housing Act doesn't make a difference. If you don't have that down payment and can't do that mortgage or can't pay that rent, you, you're not going to be able to go anywhere. So who was left behind? All the poor folks. And you've got neighborhoods now that were all brown and black and all very poor, okay? And if you take a lot of people dealing with poverty and everything associated with poverty, and then you put them in a little space <laughs> and you mush them all together, right? All these people suffering, you take all that suffering and you put it together, what do you get? You get more suffering. You get, it's like a cattle, it's called it, it, uh, peer effects or concentration effects in the social science literature, okay? You get more suffering. And that's what you do. We see this rise of places of concentrated disadvantage, and we see that the amount of suffering there is more than just the sum of everyone's individual suffering. You bring it all together, and it, it, it's explosive, okay? And the main marker of concentrated disadvantage is violence. Violence on the street and violence in homes. So all of these changes are happening, and just think through it. They're making it harder to be a parent, right? So you're trying to parent now, it's gonna be much more challenging than it was in 1970. Absolutely. And at the, so at the very same time that it was getting harder to raise children, because you couldn't have the one parent at home, because you couldn't do that, the, um, there began to be a concerted move to talk about government as being bad, shrinking government, and cutting taxes, right? So this up here, this, this again, California was a leader in this. That's Howard Jarvis in California in the late 70s. He passed, he, he championed, and we passed Proposition 13, which completely changed our, uh, the taxes on homes. And California went from having the best education system in the nation to having among one of the worst, right? Because all the money was gone. This is Reagan in 82. He's cutting the highest marginal tax rate, the tax rate for the richest folks, from 70% to 23%, okay? So taxing was changed, and then what could they say? Well, Reagan said, I'm sorry, we have to cut all this aid to cities now, because we're gonna be in deficit. We don't have enough money, because we're taking in less taxes. So cities were abandoned, right? Right when we needed more, right when we really are going to need things like the after-school program, right when you need the great teaching, right when you need all of that stuff, because you need the extra help, it begins to hollow out. Okay? Into this, we had two things that are specific to the education system. The first is standards-based accountability. Okay, what's st what's standards-based accountability in the education world? Testing. No child left behind, right? It's testing. Okay? And 
the, the, the idea was to create an accountability system for districts and schools. What they created, though, was a punitive regime, right? Where if you couldn't get your test scores up to a certain point, you were punished in a number of ways, right? Your school could be turned into a charter, your district could be taken over by the state, your school could be taken over by the district and reconstituted. Now, the thing about this accountability system, because accountability systems aren't necessarily bad things. The thing is, when you create accountability system, you always need to think, how are people gonna work it? Because that's human nature, right? People are gonna try to get around it. So you gotta build that into how you do that. How No Child Left Behind was, was designed, though, it was very, very, very intense about test scores. You had to get these scores. By 2014, across racial groups, everyone had to be proficient, right? That, that's actually what that was demanded, right? They were really strong on test scores, but they really, really, really were weak on graduation rates, okay? What they were doing is paying a lot of attention to the scores of the kids in the room, but they weren't looking at who was leaving, okay? Now, imagine that you're a principal, okay? You're in your third year of terrible test scores. The test scores, I don't know, in California, they come out around August, and school starts in around August, right? So you find out, oh my God, you literally have this school year to change it, or they're gonna dissolve it, you're gonna lose your job, everyone's gonna lose their job. You're scared, you're freaked out. You probably begin without enough teachers. So you're, you know, probably all the way through September, you're just trying to get your sea legs, right? That means you basically have from October to around April when testing happens to take a school where most kids are below basic up to proficient, okay? So changing test scores means changing teaching and learning, which is really hard, hard, hard work. It takes money, it takes time, it's in, it's, it takes embedded coaching. It takes professional learning communities. It takes teachers working really intensely with each other to get better, and you will see those test scores, but it's expensive and it takes time, okay? And you're the principal and you desperately need a shortcut, otherwise you're gonna get hurt. So what's the shortcut you can take? There's two. The first one, drill and kill, right? You can teach the test. You can spend all the time doing test prep. But what's the second one? The second one is you can work to selectively get rid of your low scoring kids, okay? So think about it like I'm a nerdy kid and so I always think about it like, you know you have quizzes in, in certain classes. You know if you get to drop your lowest two scores, what happens to your average? That shoots up, right? So this is what happened. In other words, there became a very powerful incentive to push out the lowest achieving kids. So what we see is the rise of exclusionary school discipline. Now, we didn't always suspend kids. In 1970, suspending kids was relatively rare, okay? Suspension rates have doubled, and for certain groups, nearly tripled since that time, right? So what you begin to see then is concerted efforts to get the kids who are struggling the most out of that classroom and out eventually of that school. All of this comes together to create the school to prison pipeline, okay? It leads to systematically pushing young people from the most disadvantaged families and the most disadvantaged neighborhoods, those folks who are suffering the worst over there, right? right? Out of the education, which is the opportunity enhancing system, and into an increasingly punitive criminal justice system. Okay. And what we're gonna talk about today is when you do that, it's like you, know, you hit a domino, okay? When one kid gets suspended, right? You hit a domino and boom, 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 boom. All these dominoes begin to fall such that when that child is grown up and has a kid of their own, guess what it's more likely that's going to happen? that their kid will be suspended from school. So it creates this intergenerational cycle. And listen, we're on the third generation of folks through the system of mass incarceration and school push-outs, okay? The third generation is in there right now. So I talked about suspension rates increasing. This is 72 up to 2012, okay? This is suspension rates for white kids. This is the percent of kids suspended out of school one or more times. These are white kids. It went from three at 100, 3%, 3 
in 72, 73 to 5% in 2012. So it almost doubles. This is Latino students, right? Look, in, in 72, 73, there was no gap. Exactly the same, 3%. But then by the time you get to 11, 12, it's at 7%, all right? So it more than doubles. And see this space in between? That's the emergence of the school discipline gap, right? That's the gap between Latino children and white children. This is African Americans, okay? From 6% in 72, 73, there was a difference, right? All the way up to 16% almost tripling. And if you look at this, see this space between the blue and green? It's not just that suspension rates went up, the disparity exploded, right? So what I'm gonna say about this mountain here, so one, well, one thing to think about when you look at this, let's say you put this up, let's say we didn't have the racial breakdown, and you were in, with a, a group of folks, you were with your congregation, you were with your, with your staff, and you said, what's going on here? Why are, why are more kids getting suspended? Okay. What do you think would be one, a very rational explanation for that? Drugs. Kids, well, kids are, are acting worse, right? More bad behavior, right? More drug use, more norm violation. And I usually ask, how many people think the kids now are kind of more out of control than your generation? Be real. Come on, be real, right? Okay, good, good. You know? So this is interesting. When do you think was the absolute height of youth violent crime in this country? When it was higher than it's ever, ever been. What year? 60s? No. 70s? 70s, it was, 70s was a peak, but it got even higher. 90s. It was 1994, right? Right during the crack epidemic. So it was about right here, okay? Now, since 1994, youth violent crime has dropped and dropped and dropped and dropped and dropped, and it is now at the lowest levels since we started collecting data. But look what happens to suspension rates. They just keep on climbing. That's because, essentially, we started to suspend kids for, for stuff we didn't use to suspend kids for. So what happened is that net got wider. Think it's just like, remember the story of the misdemeanors and the felonies? It's the same story, right? Which, we looked at this and we said, huh, it looks like what's driving this is a lot of the smaller things like dress code violations, right? Like uh, defiance, right? Disturbing class, right? Disrespect, all of these, these smaller things, right? Kids are suddenly getting suspended for. What we did is we said, what if we took those out? Let's just take those out and just leave like the really serious ones. Guns, drug sales or possession, um, uh, sexual battery, sexual assault, right? And we also included fighting with injury, right? So we took the serious ones out and what you saw is these lines were pretty flat with a bump in the 90s, right? Just like you'd imagine, right? So what's driving this is the smaller things. So this is what happened. I went to school in the 80s, right? In my day, right, let's say, come in, the teacher's in there, you got a kid in the back, back, sit in the back, and keeps on coming up and getting Kleenex, right? Like 17 times for Kleenex. And then he keeps on throwing it away. It's, is, this, is this distracting everybody? Is this preventing people from, it's, it's really, it's hard. You got a classroom of kids, you got one, and then he starts to throw it, right? Now, in my day, what would happen would be, let's say that kid was me. Ms. Martinez, after class, I want you to come up here, okay? Class would get out, I'd come up there, and my, you know, teacher would say, Ms. Martinez, we're gonna call your mom, and the three of us are gonna have a talk, okay? Because that's really not acceptable. Right? That's disrespectful to me, to everyone else. We need to deal with that. Okay? Now, what happens today to that kid? He's sent to the office. He's given an office referral like that. It is absolutely automatic. Okay? Now, what about the thing that in my day would have got you an office referral? Let's say my mom and dad have been fighting all night. I haven't been able to sleep. I've been afraid for my siblings and myself. I come to school, I'm exhausted, and I'm fragile. Right? and I'm sitting in the back row, 
and the teacher asked me to, to do something or to pay attention or why am, I, you know, why am I sleeping and I lose it. And I throw over my desk and I start to cry. And Now that would have got you a trip to the principal's office in my day. Now what is that going to get you today? Suspension, automatic, probably two day, right? Just automatic. Right? And the thing that in my day you got suspended for, the classic reason for getting suspended, what is it? Fighting. Fighting. What happens now when you get in fights? You get expelled, you get 10 days suspension, you get arrested. Okay? So the, what we're saying here is the same thing. This over here, remember I talked about that 430% increase? That's what the, this is the, the number of prisoners per 100,000 people. This is 1970. This is that hill that I just described. What, what I'm positing here is that, see, everything that was going on here, the war, the war on drugs, stop and frisk, mandatory minimums, mass incarceration, this very punitive mindset, right, that we had to punish, punish, this seeped culturally from the criminal justice system into the education system, kind of like with a seven to 10 year lag. And suddenly you saw in school zero tolerance, school police referring to juvenile courts and police on a regular basis, right? Now it's not that the prison guards became teachers, it's that we all sit in the same cultural soup, right? We all soak it in. Let's look at where we are today. This is the latest federal data in 1314. One thing about suspension rates is a lot of times we'll say, what's that district suspension rate? It'll give one number. Now, if that district is a K-12 district, that number's kind of meaningless because suspension rates are really different by grade span, right? Which makes sense, right? So suspensions in elementary school are notoriously low. Look at here. This is white students, about 2% of white students, right? Two out of 100 get suspended out of school one or more times. Same with Latino, 2%. Now, what's interesting is this is just a bit lower than that 3% number in 1972 that was for K-12 for all kids. Okay? But still, this is a nice low number. We'd like to see that, right? Look at African-American children, though. 7%, that means 1 in 13 are being sent. These are kids who are 11 and younger, okay? Are being sent out of school, suspended out of school one or more times. Now, I want you to think backwards from that. That's just out-of-school suspensions. Now think in-school suspensions. Think detentions. Think office referrals. Think about the experience of black children in a classroom, right? These are little kids. This is starting early. We, in fact, we know, and it's not up here, the black children are expelled from preschool at four times the rate of white children. The expulsion rates in preschools is higher than the expulsion rates in our high schools. Okay? So this starts very, very early. Let's see what happens when you go from the little ones to middle and high school students. Right? You see white goes up to 5% and Latino goes up to 8%. Notice suddenly there's a gap, right? Something happens when the Latino kids enter adolescence. Something's going on there. Look at African American, 20%. One in five, and remember this is just the out of school suspension. This is boys, okay? So this is African-American male secondary students, one in four. Latino, 11%. White boys, 7%. The next thing we brought in was disability. And by disability, we mean special ed, okay? So with special education, how are we doing on time? Okay, we got about 10 minutes before we do our break. Oh wow, we're here. Okay, give me five minutes, I'll be done, okay? Um, okay, so, uh, with, with students with disabilities, when we first saw this, because by training I'm a lawyer, policy analyst, and a researcher, right? I've been a social worker, an outreach worker, a union organizer, I've done a million things in my life, but I have never been a classroom teacher, okay? So I said, well, this is what I know about students with disabilities. First, they have more money attached to them, right? They have, and they have a right to those monies, right? They get an IEP, an individual education plan. Every kid in special ed is required to have a behavioral plan. What's a behavioral plan? It means it's an agreement. If this happens, if this type of misbehavior happens, the teacher does this first, this second, this third. These are the supports we provide. On top of that, kids in special ed have special due process rights. 
it is illegal to suspend them for something that is a manifestation of their disability. They get what's called a manifestation hearing. And in that hearing, they determine whether the behavior is a result of their disability. This is what we found. 32% of black boys in middle and high school with disabilities were being suspended out of school one or more times. 70% of Latino boys with disabilities and 14% of whites. What was happening here? Well, the teachers laughed at me, right? And they said, oh, that whole manifestation hearing thing, that doesn't, that doesn't kick in until you've accumulated 10 days of suspension. Okay, so what, can anyone guess about what, you know, special ed has like all of these subcategories, like ADHD, right, physical disability. What do you think is the subcategory with the highest suspension rates? Any guesses? So you know, is it autism, is it ADHD? It's emotional disturbance, which sounds a whole lot like behavioral problems are a manifestation of that. Okay. So we're going to stop for a break now. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, just going back, to what you're, going back to what you were saying about even at, as low as elementary school, where you have the higher rates for the, the African-American children. Yes. What, I, what that also, though, creates is that bias and that unconscious decision that the black kids are bad kids. Exactly. And the white kids are good kids. Yeah. yeah. And that, that goes in through your teachers and your classroom and your principals and that, that underlying bias is just built in. You say, well, I know this because this is what I saw personally. In schools, were you it teaching? Just built it in. Yes. This is, it, it, it's starting with little kids. The thing that blows you away is it's starting with three-year-olds. Right? But this is, and we'll talk more about this today. We'll talk about the role of implicit bias. But that's a huge thing because what it does is it renders developmentally appropriate behavior of little kids. When that child's skin is brown or black, it's seen as more violent and aggressive. And it's not conscious racism, it's unconscious bias.